All right, well, um, an effort to give everybody the times and starting on time. We can get started. I don't see anything in the chat right now. Um, but as everybody gets comfortable, hopefully they will uh, come on video and put in chat, put in the chat, you know, what brings them here today to, to learn. Um, but for everybody's information, I am Rachel. I'm with the Epilepsy Foundation of Northeastern New York. I am our health educator and advocacy coordinator. So I um, coordinated this uh, webinar. We do do quarterly webinars on different educational topics, um, bringing in professionals, uh, and experts of the topics. So today here we have Allison. Allison, I will let you give your, your own kind of introduction. Sure. Well, first of all, hi, everybody. And, and Rachel, thank you so much for inviting me and having me for this webinar. Um, feel free to come on camera, folks, if you're comfortable. If you're not, that's fine, too. Uh, I'm Allison Nichol. I'm a current role at the Epilepsy Foundation, which I've had, I think I've been there about four years, is I run the Gene A. Carpenter Legal Defense Fund. Uh, and so when I say Legal Defense Fund, I think people think of the larger legal defense funds uh, that, you know, that have many you know, many staff lawyers and big offices. Uh, I am the entire legal defense fund. I'm the only lawyer uh, that works uh, at the foundation. And so it's my their sole responsibility. Uh, so we do not take on individual cases. I mostly, you know, give people technical assistance and advice and try and hook them up individually with either lawyers in their area or other resources in their area, depending on their their um, legal situation or, or why they're calling us. Um, before coming to the foundation, I spent my uh, um, a long 30 year career uh, in the federal government as a disability rights lawyer and civil rights lawyer, uh, most of which was spent in the civil rights division of the Justice Department. Uh, in the disability rights section, the part of the Justice Department that enforces uh, the primary federal law, uh, civil rights law for people with uh, disabilities, including epilepsy, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I've been doing this work uh, for a long time. And uh, so I hope to be able to give you uh, information uh, that you can use. And I'd really like this to be, I don't come with slides, I really want this to be more of a conversation among all of us. I certainly have broken this into topics uh, and I'm gonna go through them kind of one by one, but always feel free to interact with question um, which uh, whenever you, know, you would like. So I have chosen topics for today based on how frequently I get questions about them uh, in my work. I would say far and away, the number one area of difficulty for people is employment. Uh, and that is both getting a job and keeping a job once you have it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that. And then the second most really is, depending on what time of year is education. And I would break education into K through 12, which is the bulk of it, but I also get uh, questions about higher education. In fact, I was just on um, a preparatory uh, meeting with Allison Kukla uh, about a webinar that's going to be forthcoming in August about transitioning and the college experience and how to prepare for that as a as a person with epilepsy. So look for that uh, in August. Um, so employment, education. I'm going to talk a little bit about driving and a little bit about medical marijuana, and then I'm gonna talk about whatever else you wanna talk about. Uh, but these are the major topics, and of course we don't have huge amounts of time. So I'm gonna go through the questions that I get the most frequently and try and answer them for you. Um, so let's start with employment. I think the number one question is, if I'm a person with epilepsy, do I have to disclose that when I apply for a job? And the answer is you absolutely do not have to disclose that you have epilepsy in order to apply for a job. The Americans with Disabilities Act, I'm just going to refer to it from here forward as the ADA, which is the big federal law that protects people with disabilities. And under the federal law, you as a person with epilepsy are covered as a person with a disability. You may not think of yourself as disabled, but that is the organizing principle for the law. So 
you are covered. You can bring a case of, uh, of discrimination uh, on the basis that you were discriminated against in some way because you have epilepsy. So as a part of that law, um, you, an employer cannot on an application ask you if you have any medical conditions, ask if you take any medications. Uh, during an interview, they can't ask that. They can't ask if you took excessive sick leave in your last job, if you filed a workers' compensation uh, claim in your last job. Nothing that could lead to, no direct questions about disability and no questions that could lead to you being forced to disclose in the interview uh, that you are a person with epilepsy. Now, that's the rule. I'm not here to tell you whether or not to disclose. You know, I believe in people being their authentic self. I believe that people being out uh, about their uh, medical condition to the extent that they're comfortable doing so is good. It's one of the things that challenges, you know, myths about epilepsy and stereotypes about epilepsy. And people just want to feel comfortable on the job. But uh, so the decision about that is yours, but I want you to know what your rights are. And your rights are that you do not have to disclose during any of the application or interview process, okay? Um, and then once you have what's called a conditional offer of employment, it may be conditioned on a number of things. If it's conditioned on your successfully passing a physical, it may be that if you have to have a physical exam for the job, that it will, that will definitely come up. It will definitely become known at that point between you and the doctor giving you the physical that you have epilepsy. So the employer at that point will know, but while they can get that information, but only in that post offer stage, then they cannot pull that job offer unless they can demonstrate that there's something about you having epilepsy uh, that uh, makes you then un suddenly unqualified. And that would be a very rare circumstance. Uh, but for most, most jobs now, there are not medical examinations. You mostly go through the process. You get a conditional offer. That can offer is usually conditioned on a, passing a background check more than anything else. And then you become employed, okay? So then once you're employed, they still cannot ask you if you have a medical condition, unless it is reported out that you know you are uh, performing in an unsafe manner, if someone comes to you and says, you know, I'm working on the crane with this guy and he just seemed pretty wobbly to me and I'm really worried about it. Uh, if there's some legitimate kind of report out, they can start that conversation. The more common occurrence, uh, and the only time you really have to disclose is if you ask for a reasonable accommodation. So let's say uh, you have nocturnal seizures, as an example, and you currently work middle shift, three to 11. And because they lose some employees, <clears throat> they wanna move you to midnight shift. And that's a shift you can't work because you have nocturnal seizures. Um, and so that's a situation where you would you know, ask for uh, a reasonable accommodation of only having day shift or middle shift. And in the course of that process, the employer does have a right to ask for medical documentation, some current, recent, not your whole medical record, saying, you know, you have A, that you have epilepsy, and B, that the kind of seizures you have uh, require you to work only day or middle shift. So in that reasonable accommodation process, uh, you do have to disclose if, if the basis for your request is that you have epilepsy. Um, and then the question is how much documentation, I think simple note from your doctor should be sufficient. So don't get caught in this trap of, now we need all of your medical records from when you were five years old because employers clearly do not have a right to go that, that deep into your medical background. Um, and so, one of the concerns I hear a lot from people is, well, I want to disclose because what happens if I have a seizure and nobody knows what to do? I mean, they're concerned about their own safety and well-being, which is perfectly understandable. And so 
For them, that means they want to disclose during the interview process. Uh, what I tell people, again, is there's another way of dealing with that. As soon as you get hired, ask for a reasonable accommodation, put a seizure plan in place. Uh, that way the information about your medical condition stays very contained, right? Um, because in the reasonable accommodation process, all the documentation that you give them, the request, the medical documentation, it all has to be kept confidential. So confidential that it's not even in your personnel file. They have to have a separate file uh, for those documents. So not everybody willy nilly who's going through the personnel files can see your private medical information. So what I recommend to people is if it is a concern of yours, perfectly understandable, use, instead of disclosing up front, you can use the reasonable accommodation process to put that plan in place for your safety. And then the only people who have a need to know about that are whoever needs to execute the plan, whether it's a supervisor uh, or, or a set of shift supervisors. And that way, you know, your medical information to the greatest extent possible uh, remains confidential and remains yours and yours alone. So those are kind of the, I guess, the highlights. Um, and so the question is, is an employer required to give you the accommodation requested? The employer's obligation is to give you a reasonable accommodation. It doesn't necessarily have to be the exact accommodation you're asking for as long as it is effective. So let's say in the example I just gave of the, the inability to work night shift, let's say the person goes in and says, I, I have to only work day shift. Well, I don't think the documentation is not going to support that request. The documentation is going to support the request that you not work midnights, but that doesn't mean they have to give you day shift. They can also give you middle shift. Right, so that's not what you asked for, but as long as it's not midnight, it's still effective. Um, I think most reasonable accommodations go along pretty well with the exception of a couple. Uh, unpredictable absences are frowned upon by employers, no matter what the cause. Um, if you have a seizure at work and you're injured, that you know, um, they're gonna see you as problematic from that point. Um, and the other thing is employers, um, let me turn my phone off. I'm sorry, I'm getting ding, ding, ding. Uh, let me turn this off, I, I apologize. Um, one of the things that employers like to do is stick a person in an ambulance, even though the, uh, maybe all the person really needs is 10 minutes off in a quiet spot to lay down. Uh, that's another situation where I think you ask for a reasonable accommodation that they not call an ambulance, that they give you a quiet place and, you know, X amount of recovery time. I, I would handle that again through the reasonable accommodation um, process. So it is true that they don't have to give you exactly what you want, but it has to be something that continues to allow you to work in your job, basically. I hope that answered your question. Was there a second thing that came in? A second question? Um, is, is it, uh, is it, do you hear me? I do. Yes. Uh, I have this situation where my daughter um, had a couple of seizures at work and uh, she um, asked not to work nights because she needs her sleep, uh, or at least in the evening. And uh, she basically, her manager made it clear that that was not convenient and that, uh, you know, that she, uh, she could not always have uh, no night shifts. And uh, I was just uh, wondering if she would be like, she made it clear, my daughter, that she could do day, sh day shifts and mid shifts, but not night shifts. Mm -hmm. And she was not happy with that, the, the manager. And just, I'm just wondering, you know, um, it just so happened that other managers uh, did allow her to uh, finally do what she wanted, which is a day shifts. 
but if she hadn't, and um, this manager would insist on her doing night shifts, is there any recourse I could have? Uh, did your daughter work in a union shop? No. Okay. Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, certainly a failure to provide a reasonable accommodation uh, can be seen as a violation um, of the ADA. Um, and you can file with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is a federal agency that enforces the employment provisions um, of the ADA. Um, there's also an organization called the Job Accommodation Network, uh, JAN.org, uh, that will help people uh, like your daughter who are, are trying to get reasonable accommodation and the employer is being resistant. They can sometimes help with the wording or you know, putting the right legal language in there to kind of let the employer know this is a more kind of official request. Uh, going through the, I highly recommend going through the official uh, reasonable accommodation process, whatever it is, because once you do that, usually the lawyers are alerted and it's just, uh, uh, I think, I think it's a, it would be an easy yes that that was a reasonable accommodation unless, you know, there's some business reason why it, it can't be. I, I mean, I don't know uh, particularly, but yes, there are, there are recourses. I try to tell people that you want to maintain the employment relationship if it's at all possible, even if you don't get perfectly what you want, even if the law says you're entitled to more. Um, because the remedies <clears throat> that I just described can take five years, right? And so it's not that you're gonna to go to the EOC and they're gonna come and tell your employer they have to accommodate you. They're gonna take your charge and getting an appointment with the EOC can take up to five months now just to get the appointment. They're going to have make a charge and then investigate it and then make a finding. And so either way, your daughter is going to long have long moved on from that job because uh, she can't work there anymore. If she can't get the shifts she wants. So um, so I, I work hard with people to try and find a path forward where they can maintain the employment relationship, even if they don't get exactly what they want or exactly what the law would uh, require. Thank you. You're welcome. And Gail? Yes, hi. Um, I thought it was very interesting you mentioned that the medical um, revelations should be kept in a confidential separate sort of file. Is there a code or an exact title of that? Like, would it be like HIPAA and then a sub designation? as to what employers um, are required to do to keep that confidentiality? Is there no, a it's not, I'm sorry. No, it's not HIPAA. Uh, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act, okay. Code of Regulations, um, which you can find on the EEOC website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually just go to eeoc.gov and in the upper right hand, you'll see a search box and just plug in reasonable accommodation, medical records, and the code provision will pop, pop up. It's actually written into the law and into the regulations uh, that it has to be kept in separate areas. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, are we, I, I don't know if I can see everybody and I'm gonna sort of uh, move on. So uh, I think I've just described what happens if you get terminated. And I will just say, you want to get terminated, not quit. Because if you leave voluntarily, it is really so much harder to prove that you were forced out uh, by um, you, you're not, you not being accommodated, okay? So I really, and I know sometimes it's very hard to hang in there, but if you can hang in there um, until they terminate you, you have a better case. Um, and hopefully, you know, look, look I, I specialize in worst case scenarios. You may work at 20 employers and have great experiences. I'm just addressing the situations in which you may not have great experiences. Uh, so you don't have to disclose, except in the reasonable accommodation process. Uh, 
You can use that process for a seizure safe plan. Uh, you would use that process for the, you know, the shift stuff we just talked about. They should ask for just a modest amount and not your all of your medical records. Do not give these people all of your medical records. They're absolutely not entitled to that. Um, and then if, if a termination occurs, you have, except in, I think it's the state of Alabama, uh, but you can go on eoc.gov and find out you have only 300 days to file a charge of discrimination with the EEOC. So it's not, you can't wait uh, beyond that 300 day period uh, in order to, to file. And so fi when you file within 10 days, the EOC notifies your employer that there's been a complaint filed. Sometime you can use that to negotiate either a better exit package or a way to maintain the employment relationship. They may come back and say, we don't want to the CEOC breathing down our neck. You know, we'll put you on that middle shift or whatever it is. Um, I have to say the bulk of cases that I see, but these are just the cases I see. Uh, they usually end up on the doorstep of the EEOC. So be, I'm going to move on now um, um, to education. But before I do, are there any more questions about employment? I know that's a, a big area for folks. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now uh, to the uh, K through 12 experience. Um, if you, you may have had your own experience in K through 12, if you have children, they may be um, go, who have epilepsy or really other disabilities. You may yourself have some experience with going through the K through 12 process and trying to get uh, accommodations and modifications and aids in this, this for, your, for your child. And again, there, so there are two systems really uh, in K through 12 education. The one that is most often used um, is a system that's laid out in a law called the IDEA, uh, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. And that is a federal law but the federal law is carried out by the states. So the federal law says, we're gonna give you this money states, and then you're gonna set up a state process for school districts to come into compliance with what the IDEA requires, as opposed to section 504, which is the other system, that is a federal law, that is administered by the Department of Education in Washington, okay? So the IDEA is really the states taking federal money and then laying out a system to, to uh, adjudicate the needs of children uh, who need what's called an individualized education plan. An individualized education plan usually occurs when learning is implicated. Right, and so there's something about the manner or the method of the educational experience uh, that isn't working for your child or for a child with epilepsy or another type of disability. So that can mean that your child has effects from their epilepsy that include developmental delays, uh, that include perhaps a slow reading rate, uh, or, or other, uh, or your child may have a, a comorbid condition uh, that impacts learning. So there are huge differences in these two programs, right? And so I'm gonna talk about um, the IDEA IEP process first. Um, the school plays a very large role in the IEP process, they're supposed to. Um, they're supposed to bring experts to the table to kind of in, envelop your child in and create the best learning experience for them, given whatever their mo needed modifications or accommodations are. Uh, if your child has an aid, you most likely have an IEP. If they get extra time on tests, you most likely have an IEP. Um, um, and uh, if your child, for instance, 
has more frequent seizures and your child needs to you know, be removed from the classroom for a period of time and then go back, that certainly impacts learning because it impacts the amount of time that you're in the classroom and your ability to concentrate and learn you know, on any given day. Uh, so there are a whole range of uh, types of accommodations or modifications uh, that kids um, uh, might need, right? Um, and so <clears throat> the IEP process is that you go through, the school is very involved. They bring experts, you can bring an expert if you want. Uh, they are theoretically there to do what is best for your child. I haven't always found that to be the case. Um, so that there's a lot of upside to that because you do have access to a lot of free expertise. And theoretically, educators should want your child to be in the best position to learn. Um, there is one thing about that process that can be an upside or a downside, and that is it is an administrative process that has to be exhausted before you can go to court. So it's not as though if your child is not getting the modifications they need under their IEP, you can jump out of that and go to federal court and sue the school district. You have to go through the administrative process. You go up through the administrative process, the appeals, you go uh, all the way to a hearing, then there's a hearing. And only at the end of that, if, if it's still unresolved, which is pretty uncommon, um, would you be able to sue in a federal court? Okay, so that's this system. Section 504 is different. Section 504, it is a federal law like the IDEA, but Section 504 doesn't have that state administrative component. So if your child's 504 rights are being violated, you can go straight. You can go, I would first file with a complaint with the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights, <clears throat> Office of Civil Rights in Washington, see if they can resolve it because litigation is expensive. Um, but if it isn't resolved, you do have the ability um, to file uh, in federal court directly in a way that you don't under the IDEA. Despite that fact, I still recommend that people get um, an IEP if they can, because I think it carries uh, greater obligations on the part of the school district. School districts are used to the IEP process, and I think it's likely your child will get more modifications and accommodations through an IEP than they will uh, under Section 504. So that's kind of, and I understand that's a broad lay, I mean, you know, to really understand these two different systems, uh, it would take us at least five hours, right? So I'm just trying to give you kind of a broad overview of you have these two choices. This is more detailed, comes with the administrative process. This is less detailed, but you might not get what you want through 504 the same way you can in an IEP. So uh, I strongly encourage you to consider both. Um, you know, Office of Civil Rights website at the Department of Education, doe.gov, has a ton of information on all of this. Um, and so I, I highly recommend that you, you know, you can always call me, of course, but you can also get a, a tremendous amount um, of information. The one thing, the federal government, in terms of the offices of civil rights do well, is put out plain language documents that non-lawyers can understand to help them understand these processes and what may be best for their child. So our, I'm gonna to move to higher education next, uh, unless there are questions about this. I don't, I don't understand, was that, can you read that question? I didn't quite understand it. Hello? Hi, read. Gail. Go, yeah. Oh, Gail, hi. Go yes, ahead. I, I, sometimes there's um, unspoken rules about volunteering or referring to other groups. Um, however, I think it's important there's a New York State um, group called Parent to Parent, and they are highly skilled and they specialize in this whole realm of special education. 
for people of uh, within New York State. Parent oh, no, parent, I think that's great. <clears throat> and they give seminars great. and they go into such detail on how the state fits with the law. I wish I, I think had that's heard great. Of it years ago. Yeah. Great. Forget. Okay. Thank you okay. for sharing that. Okay, anybody else with uh, either suggestions for more information or questions about the uh, K through 12 process before we move to higher ed? Okay, so actually I was just on a planning meeting this morning for uh, a webinar that we're gonna be doing, I think in the first week of August on this whole issue of transitioning uh, from high school to college. Um, and I will give you just kind of a brief overview of the things you want to be thinking about um, if you're the person making the transition or if you have a child in that situation. Once you are, once you are no longer in high school, you, the IDEA goes away. There is no more IDEA. There is no more IEP for your child. What's left are your rights under section 504. Okay, because you always have 504 rights, but IEP, no. So your child is gonna go through a huge transition because they're used to being, getting what they need. Somebody else is doing that for them, either it's a school or the parent advocating for them. And so I tell parents that at some point you have to start encouraging your child to be a self-advocate because when they get to college, None of those people that you support them are going to be there. And you're not going to be there either, even though I think you probably think you are. Um, but you're not, right? And so I encourage uh, people to think carefully when they're choosing a college, what is disability friendly and what is not. Um, I encourage people to start early to learn at a particular college. Well, what is the process if I need some kind of a modification? Generally, the modifications in learning are professor by professor. Um, and that certainly is not something that your child is going to have been uh, used to. Um, and so that is, uh, there's, it's a huge change uh, in terms of support systems and what you have been expecting and receiving versus what you may or may not receive uh, in college. And so I think there are listservs out there, there are other. Um, places that can give you a sense of <clears throat> whether a school is disability friendly or not. I mean, one sure way to tell is go on their website, look at the disability office. If there's only one person that works there, the chances are that isn't necessarily going to be a good experience uh, if your child needs uh, modifications in learning or housing or anything else. Specific things that come up in college are. Um, and this is especially true if your child has a comorbidity involving mental health or depression. Uh, you want to know how that's handled on that college campus. You want to know that it's a supportive environment culturally. So they can have a lot of great policies, but culture eats policies for lunch. So what is the overarching experience is determined by the culture, not by the policies, right? You want, uh, you want a disability positive uh, environment. So if they have good mental health services, if they have a, a good size disability office, those are, you know, those are good signs. There may even be support groups on campus. Um, the other thing I think your child is gonna have to get used to and you may too is that uh, most colleges, if the child has a seizure, the professor's gonna call 911. The nurse is not going to come from across campus to administer medication uh, to your child. And so that's a, a, huge, a huge change. Um, and I think that's something that you need to contemplate and think about and prepare your child for. Uh, the other thing are just kind of the peer pressures that there are in college, pressures to drink, pressures to stay up too late, not you know, interrupt your sleep patterns. So, you know, if, if sleep is important, I think it is to every uh, person with epilepsy, 
don't schedule morning classes, schedule afternoon classes, uh, things that are, you know, within your, uh, within your, you know, ability to take good care of yourself. You're gonna to wanna to know what the rules are for housing. Colleges are different on this. Some colleges will insist that your child have a roommate, even though they want the peace and quiet and non-distraction of being alone or the opposite. They will um, tell you, you have to have a, that you, what did I just say? Whatever is the opposite of that. So you can't have a roommate or uh, you need to have a roommate. So either one of those in terms of housing, you need to uh, figure that out. Um, that, that's very uncommon, but it does happen. And so I think you want to figure out that you want somebody in the room with your child in case there's a seizure, or you want your child left alone so they, it's less likely they have a seizure because there are further uh, you know, distractions. I will tell you that you know, I had a case um, actually from the great state of New Jersey not that long ago. This young man was really having a rough time uh, with his seizures and he was in a, a very expensive, very good school. Uh, and they were going to make him repeat an entire semester because he wasn't able to complete his last assignments on time. So his dad called me and I'm like, oh no, your son needs to call me. Your son is an adult and I need to talk to your son. And so we actually worked over the course of a weekend, but I actually made the son sit down and write out specifically what accommodations that he needed in terms of time to be as reasonable as possible and specific as possible. So they had had some chance of getting them to agree <coughs> To let him close out the semester and that that is how it worked out but losing i mean aside from the pra the very practical that semester cost sixty thousand dollars right and so that would have been a very uh expensive burden for the family as well um and so you know there's lots of great information about uh how you get accommodations you know be respectful be as specific as possible don't ask for things you don't need. Ask for just the things that seem reasonable that can get you through. Um, that's, you know, so that's what I recommend. Um, so though, that's kind of a broad overview um, of the college experience. I encourage you to look for our August um, webinar. Uh, the person from the University of Chicago uh, who runs the disability office is actually going to be on that webinar as, as well as a college student who has faced many of the lived experiences on campus <coughs> that we're talking about. So if you and your and or your child want more detail on that, I think that's a good place uh, to go. So any, um, any questions about higher ed before I move on to a few other things? I don't see any, Rachel, so I'm gonna move forward. Okay, uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about driving and I have a few, I think, important uh, things to say. Uh, I think most of you, if not all of you know that, uh, I'm sorry, Gail, did you have a question? Yes, I'm very sorry. I was trying to type it. I thought you pre-read them. Um, so that's a very good example whereby um, you wanted to hear directly from the potential claimant, which is the son in college to repeat. Um, so for your purposes, what actually is a citizen's adult age? And my second part of that is why is it that New York State is asserting that disabled um, people are under the auspices of what they think up to, you know, age 21, age 26? Well, I don't know the answer to the second question because I don't know what okay. the auspices of whatever are, but uh, when I talk about an adult, uh, I'm talking about a person who's going to go to college for higher ed, going to go to college and be able to function on their own. It, would that, is that 18 or 21? or? It doesn't matter to me whenever they go to college. I mean, some will go right out of high school, some may delay a year. But it, it, to me, it's not the number 
it's whenever they are ready to have the experience. Right. I don't care about the number. I don't, I think you can go to college anytime as long as you have, I mean, there are kids that go to college at 13 because they're geniuses. So I, there is no magic number as far as I know for getting into college in terms of age. Oh, I was just wondering in the Office of Civil Rights, what is the view from the federal standpoint as to when a disabled citizen is actually considered an adult, 18, 21 or 26? I'm sorry, I just don't understand that question. What do you, the federal system is many different things. Right. There are many different programs. For, um, for a citizen to assert that their rights are violated um, and have a standalone case, is, I was just wondering, it, you know, in the regular world, it's 18, but then of course we have other uh, laws, which, you know, you can't do this till 21. And then in New York state, they are often quoting that the state has control up to age 26 or whatever the funding is. Has control of what? Of a, of a person's autonomy. I'm sorry, I'm just not at all familiar with that. All I can really yeah. tell you is that mm -hmm. the Americans with Disabilities Act does not have, you know, you do not have to be of a certain age. I mean, we're, I've represented uh, children who are in uh, daycare under the Americans with Disabilities okay. Act. So. I mean, it probably depends on the system. So I'm sorry, I just okay. can't uh, answer that question for you. Oh, okay. Well, I think you just did answer it, that there is a concern and you have seen representation for even um, citizens under the age of 18. If it's been violated, there's a means of um, addressing that. There's no age limit on your civil rights. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll move to driving. So I think you all know that um, every state has a law uh, that puts restrictions on people uh, who have a seizure or lose consciousness uh, or have, um, you know, it, it isn't, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily say the word epilepsy. Sometimes it just says, talks about a loss of consciousness. Um, and they range uh, from, license and suspension range from three months on the low side to a year on the high side. Um, and I want to tell you that your, your, you and your children should take that very seriously. They're very practical uh, implications, negative implications for not uh, following uh, what you're supposed to do. Some states require your neurologist or epileptologist to um, notify the DMV that you've had a seizure and shouldn't be driving. Other um, states require that you self-report. And if it requires that you self-report, you do in fact have a duty to make that self-report and take that suspension. Um, there can be uh, extremely, extremely dire consequences for not doing that. If you know that you're not supposed to be driving because you've had a seizure and you're driving either on a suspended license or you're driving because you did not report and you get into an accident and you injure someone or worse, uh, that carries significant dire consequences. I have been dealing with an attorney right now who has a client who did exactly that and is facing vehicular homicide, um, 40 years in prison charges right now. Um, so I strongly, strongly encourage you, and I know it's tough, I'm not saying it's not, especially if you're in a more rural area, but my job is just to tell you what the consequences are and they can be dire. It, you know, if you're driving on a suspended license or you're driving when you know you're not supposed to and you didn't make that report, there is no guarantee that your insurance company is gonna cover any of those damages, uh, including a large punitive damage award if, if somebody you know, is injured or worse. So there are just real world um, consequences to that. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with autonomous vehicles. I think that there is going to come a time in the next 10 or 15 years, certainly in your children's lifetime, where we will have autonomous vehicles, and that will be a huge boon uh, to, to all kinds of people who can't drive, including people with epilepsy. But we are a long uh, way from that. Um, I think one of the considerations, especially young people, might want to look at when they're choosing uh, not just college, but beyond college into employment is, are they living in an area where they can have access to transportation if they can no longer drive? Um, are you in a more urban centered area? 
you know, do they have Uber? Do they have trains? Do they have buses? Uh, this kind of thing. Uh, so that's that's the primary thing. The other thing I want to to touch on more generally, but it, it really impacts driving. I get lots and lots and lots of calls, not just from young people, but they are primarily from young people who have smoked their medical marijuana or ingested their medical marijuana, however they do it, and then decide it was okay to drive their car. And they get stopped because they're, you know, either going 10 miles an hour or, you know, weaving in, in and out of lanes. And they do not understand that you cannot smoke pot and drive your car any more than you can drink a six pack of beer and drive your car. But they always say, well, I have a prescription for that. So I get to do that. No, you don't. Not any more than if you took another kind of prescription that says on the label, don't take this pill and drive your car or operate heavy machinery. But there's a real disconnect for some reason uh, with medical marijuana in young people and what they feel is their ability to drive. Um, you know, medical marijuana is a very complex set of laws there, you know, uh, marijuana is still illegal under, uh, it's still scheduled one drug federally. Uh, every state has different laws about this. Um, schools have different policies about this, depending on what their state law is, but understanding that the federal law still makes it grossly illegal as a schedule one drug. So you have situations now where a student wants their medical marijuana on, on, a, on a high school campus and the state law allows for that. But if a teacher needed it as a reasonable accommodation, they wouldn't be able to get it because the federal ADA does not cover you if you are what's called an active drug user. And since marijuana is a schedule one drug, uh, you would then be considered an active drug user. And so the teacher would lose their job the student should be able to get that as a modification for their experience, uh, both on the same high school campus. So trying to figure out uh, the laws around medical marijuana is very, very complicated. Can you travel with medical marijuana on an airplane? I don't recommend it. I have to say that, you know, I've worked with TSA for a long time as well. They're not a law enforcement agency. If they find your medical marijuana, they're probably gonna say, you need to toss this. Um, but they're not gonna arrest, they don't have the power of arrest. They do have the power to detain you and call local law enforcement <laughs> if they find your marijuana and, kick up, and you kick up a fuss about it. And there's literally no way to predict from airport to airport how that's gonna go. Um, and so that is a, you know, a continuing problem because we still have it as a schedule one drug. I don't, I honestly don't know why that still is, um, but it is, and we have not been able to make, uh, well, the farm bill allowed, allows the CBD. This is a, you know, a completely different, uh, different problem. And so, um, you know, you can go on TSA's website, you can go on DOT's website, but I think they do discourage you from, um, and I would say the same about traveling over interstate lines, even in a car. You know, if you go from a state that allows it to a state that doesn't, that's gonna be a problem, right? And so, you know, if, if, you, if Illinois has a medical marijuana law and Wisconsin doesn't, you know, it's gonna be a problem. Uh, the other problem with marijuana as opposed to alcohol is that we have a good measure for alcohol, right? if you're drinking and driving. We have a breathalyzer, we have a blood test. The problem with marijuana is that it stays in your system much longer than alcohol. So it may be that you didn't smoke this marijuana for like two, three days ago and nothing since, but it will still show up on that blood test, at least in trace amounts. And that's enough for probable cause for an arrest for driving under the influence of drugs. And so it's a very, very complex area um, all I can really say is be super careful, um, especially when you're traveling. Um, and we are close to time. Yes, Rachel. So the other thing I wanna do before I get, uh, uh, bring us all to a close is give you my number. 
This is a, uh, a voicemail box at, uh, for the Legal Defense Fund. That number is 301-918-3767. And that will, if you call that number and you have a legal question, just leave it on that number and I'll be happy to get back to you as soon as I can. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Rachel. All right, so I was just dropping that in the chat. So I just put that number uh, in the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, Allison, if you want to check and see if that was correct. <laughs> it was correct. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, if anybody has any further questions, please feel free to come off mute or drop them in the chat right now. Um, if you have any burning questions that you are waiting until the end to ask, please feel free to do that. Um, Without seeing any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you should have gotten an email from me to join this, but I will also put my email in the chat. Um, so I can, can I ask uh, one last question? Absolutely. Um, if my daughter has to work like part time for her, her whole life because of her disability, does she have um, the right to like uh, part time in unemployment or, or even um, social security disability type? So there are two uh, disability systems in the federal uh, system. One is social security disability. You have to have worked a number of quarters for that, um, which really translates it into a number of years. I don't know her age or how long she's been working. Uh, and there are restrictions uh, for how much you can work. Um, uh, the other system is called SSI, and that is a needs-based system. Uh, so you can have literally no assets uh, in order to qualify for that. Uh, the amount that you get under that system is less than $1,000 a year. It may also qualify for SNAP benefits. Uh, the SSDI does not have the same um, qualification that you can't have assets. Uh, but the uh, but their calculation they're making under SSDI is whether or not someone can do a job that uh, exists in the general uh, economy. And if your daughter is currently working, that itself is evidence that the answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be uh, more difficult. Uh, it's always more difficult to qualify under that program. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, those are the two available. Unemployment, I honestly don't. I think if it is your choice, uh, and I understand it's being compelled by her epilepsy, um, to, um, I, I don't, you'd have to check. Unemployment insurance is a state law question. So you'd really have to consult with a lawyer who does that in whatever, I don't know if you're in New York or New Jersey. Um, but my initial instinct is to say probably not. Okay, thank you. Also, one last question is concerning the, the driving. What is the law in New York? Uh, you know, how long after a seizure does she not, can she not drive? And also she has never reported that she has epilepsy to the DMV, but she's been very religious about not driving where she, when she's not supposed to and waited a whole year. So I'm just wondering, um, but now her, her neurologist is offering to give her a note saying that if she doesn't have a seizure by the end of July, she can drive again. But then she never told the DMV in the first place that she had epilepsy. So should I, uh, should she uh, go to the DMV and, and just let them know now um, or not? Well, if that's a very complex fact-based question, I can't answer it on this, on yeah. this, uh, I, I, again, if she was supposed to have reported and didn't, that is not a good thing. Uh, but I think what you want to do is call me at that 301 number because I would need many more facts than you've just presented in order to, to steer you in the right direction. I, I suppose I didn't know that she was supposed to report it. Well, I don't know whether she is or not. In New York in State. In New York. I understand that, ma'am. I'm saying I don't oh, know whether okay. she does or not. All I'm right. not sitting here looking at the state law. I so see. that's why I think calling me is, is a better course I for see. that. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh, you're welcome. Great, and um, we may be having a, a 
driving specific in New York State logs webinar later in the year, um, because that is a very complex topic uh, to go over the driving laws and reporting. Do I or don't I kind of a thing. So for yes, a and, specific purpose, and as you know, New York, you know, made huge changes to their law just yeah. a couple of years ago. And that's why I don't know the laws I sit here because it's much more complicated than most. Absolutely. Yeah. New York likes to make things as complicated as possible usually. So um, so thank you again so much, Allison, um, sure. from joining us uh, from not New York. <laughs> We really appreciate. Uh, Welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. And, uh, you know, you have my number. Absolutely. All right. And feel free to reach out to either of us with any specific questions. Thank you both.